Good day. Welcome to another session of Fog Accountancy Tutorials. Today we are going to learn IS40 investment property. That is what we are going to talk about. This is an international accounting standard that talks about investment property. But first of all, what is the scope? What is investment property all about? Remember that I said something in the IES 16 video, which I want to repeat here again. Now, we all know that we have non-current assets in every business. Most businesses, let me say. Now, these non-current assets are regulated by standards. We have non-current assets that are tangible, and we have non-current assets that are intangible. Now, with a tangible non-current asset, we have those that are owner-occupied. When we say owner-occupied properties, they are properties that have physical existence that is being used by the business to raise funds. And then we have those that are being given out as rentals. So we rent them out for income. And then also, it's also kept for capital appreciation or whatever. Now, what we are trying to say is that the non-current asset tree is such that the intangibles are regulated by IAS 38, a standard that I'm going to talk about next. And then also, those that are the owner-occupied are being regulated by IAS 60, which we call property, plant, and equipment. Now, the tangible non-current assets that are being rented out for income or held for capital appreciation or both is called investment property and is being regulated by IES 40. And that is what we are going to talk about today. And so what we are going to talk about today is about tangible non-current asset that is being held for the purpose of giving it out for rentals or for capital appreciation. I'm going to come into the capital appreciation as well. But this is the tree of non-current assets as far as these three standards are concerned. And this is our focus for today. We've already spoken about the property, plant, and equipment. And then we are coming to talk about investment property, which is IES 40. Okay. Now, what is investment property? I would say that investment property, investment property re refers to tangible non-current assets that are held for two reasons. And these two reasons, it could be either one or both at the same time. One, for rentals. Two, for capital appreciation. And so we will say that investment property is about tangible, it's about tangible non-current assets that are held for rentals, capital appreciation, or both. Now, so when you are defining investment property, you say they are properties or they are tangible non-current assets that are held for rentals, comma, capital appreciation, or both. So there could be a property that you are holding for the purpose of renting it out for rental income, or you are holding it like land for capital appreciation. So you buy land, you leave the land for capital appreciation. In the next five years, the value of the land would have appreciated. That is what we mean by capital appreciation, or both. So you can have land, rent out the land, so whilst you are earning rental income, it is still appreciating in value. And that is what we call the both. Now, and it means that there are some things that are not part of investment property. So it means that we don't use investment property as we use inventories. And then we don't use them as owner-occupier. So IS-16, owner-occupied property is not part of investment property. And then also inventories which comes under IAS 2 is also not part of investment property. So when you are defining investment property, please take notes that this is what you are going to talk about. These are the key things that is going to bring out your marks for investment properties definition. Now, having been able to understand investment property, let us look at what investment property is not about or exclusions from investment property or things that are not investment property. Now, these are exclusions from investment property. In other words, the following are not investment property. So let me say exclusions from investment property. The following are not investment properties. So please take note. The first one is inventories. Inventories is being regulated by IES2, another standard that I'm going to treat very soon. Now, 
inventories are not investment properties. So these are properties that are being held for sale in the ordinary course of business. So that is how you see it in most books. Instead of they writing inventory, you see that they would define inventory as properties that is being held for sale in the ordinary course of business. That is not an investment property. Now, another thing that is not an investment property is owner-occupied property. Owner-occupied property. An owner-occupied property is regulated by IAS 16, and that is PPE. So when you see owner-occupied property, it is not an investment property. Then the next exclusion from investment property, biological assets. Biological assets are regulated by IAS 41, agriculture. And so biological assets, that is assets that are being used in a farm, are not part of investment property. And then also properties that are being constructed for third parties. under IES 11, construction contracts. So when you are con constructing a property for a third party, that property that is being constructed for third party does not fall under the category of an investment property. Now, these things that I am mentioning to you, they are very serious because you could be examined on them, you could be asked, what is not an investment, what are not investment properties? And then you should be able to talk about them. Or you could be asked, to advise a company on a question on investment property. And if you see some of these things inclusive, you should advise them to take it out because they are not part of investment property. And then finally, let me add this. Properties that is being leased out under a finance lease. So property that is being leased out to LZ under a finance lease that is under that is under IFRS 16 leases so property that is being leased out to a lessee under a finance lease finance lease does not form part of investment property Finance lease does not form part of investment property. So these are five exclusions from investment property. Now, if these are what investment property is not, then what is investment property? So I'm going to talk about exam. I'm going to give you some examples of investment property. What investment property is all about? I'm going to give you examples of investment property. Okay. All right. So what are some examples of investment property? These are examples of investment property. So, examples. One, land held for long-term capital appreciation. So, when you buy land and then you hold it for long-term capital appreciation, then it is classified under investment property. So, we know many of us, we do that. We buy land, businesses buy land, and they don't touch the land immediately. But they allow the land to be there and... As time goes on, the value of the land appreciates. That qualifies to be called an investment property. The second example that I will see for investment property will be land held for undetermined future use. Undetermined future use. Now, please don't confuse the two. The first one was on purpose. The second one was not on purpose. The first one, you intentionally bought the land because there are, there are speculations that the land values or land prices will rise up in the near future. You bought them down specially or specifically for the purpose of the capital appreciation in the future, which you are expecting because of the speculations. But the second one, the intention was not for that. You bought the land, but then... You have not determined yet what you are going to do with the land. So the land is there, but then you are still planning what to do with the land. 
nevertheless the value of the land will go up okay whether it was intentionally kept for capital appreciation or not once you have not determined the future use of the land and the land lies idle it is still classified as an investment property these things are very important that you understand them because once you understand these concepts and questions come you'll be able to know how to turn your way around them okay now the next example that i'm going to mention will be a building leased out under an operating lease so building leased out to lz under an operating lease now remember that when we're talking about exclusions from investment property we made mention of the fact that finance lease land or any property that is leased out under a finance lease does not form part of investment property okay because when you are into finance lease the risk and rewards are all transferred to the lazy and therefore it doesn't become an investment property but in the case of an operating lease the risk and re rewards still lies with the lazor and therefore when a company leases out a building to another person or company under an operating lease that qualifies to be called an investment property because that building is an investment property just because it is more like a renter we take lease payment this is an operating lease eventually the ownership of the building is not likely to be transferred at the end of the lease period and that is what makes it an investment property so this is a third example of investment property that i'll give you now the next is also an interesting one because it's just like the third one now a vacant building held to be leased out under an operating lease you see make no mistake to think they are the same the third point says that building that has been leased out already under, no, under an operating lease. Now, the fourth one says a vacant building held to be leased out. So the building is there. We've not leased it out yet. But the moment the intention is to lease it out, it doesn't fall under IES 16. It rather falls under IES 40 as an investment property because the intention is that eventually we are going to lease it out under an operating lease. We are going to give it out for rental so to say and therefore whether it has been given out as an operating lease or it is yet to be given out the intention is there it still falls under the classification of an investment property now look at the fifth example it says that property that is being constructed or developed for future use as an investment property another interesting point this time the property is not even ready yet but these are properties that is being constructed so you are building a, a house but the main motive of building the house is that you are going to rent it out in the future after it's completed now because the intention for constructing the building is that you are going to use it as an investment property and not as an owner occupied property then it means that right from the scratch that you are constructing it even though it is not yet completed you are allowed to classify that as an investment property that is what the standard is saying property that is being constructed or developed for future use as an investment property is an example still of an investment property just because the intention of construction is that you are going to eventually use it as an investment property so that is the meaning okay now that we've been made known some examples of investment property let us look at some other peculiar things that we need to know let us take for example that you own a land or you have a building and you are occupying half of the building and you rent half out how are you going to treat the value of the entire building in your financial statement because if you are occupying it yourself it's owner occupied it goes under ies 16 property plant and equipment if you are renting it out it goes under investment property but if you are renting out 
part and then you are occupying part. Then this is what the standard says, that you should value the part that you are renting out. Okay? And then classify that part as investment property. And the portion of the building that you are occupying as a business is owner-occupied. You classify that portion as property, plant, and equipment. So the value of the building is going to be split into owner-occupied as one part where you are staying and then and using. And then the parts that is being rented out will also be classified as an investment property. So they will go as two separate values on your financial statement. That is what we are talking about. Now, in such a scenario, what we do is that, imagine that you are about to dispose of such a building. Are you going to sell it as a sale of PP or sale of investment property? It depends. If at the time of sale, the portion of the owner occupied is very insignificant, you can sell the whole building as a sale of investment property. But if it's very significant, you can still take the same procedure. You sell and you split portion as sale of investment property and then portion as a sale of PPE. So these things happen, that we have a same property where part will be investment property and a portion of that property will be owner occupied or IAS 16 property plant and equipment asset. So that is what we are trying to differentiate for you. Now another thing that you should also understand is that there are times when you rent out a building to a lazy under an operating lease and then you perform some ancillary services to the occupier of the investment property. Now, it depends on the nature of ancillary services that you are performing. If the nature of the ancillary services is such that it's not significant, like for example, you rent out your house or your building to someone to occupy as an investment property, then you, the company who is renting out, you, the landlord, you provide security for the person, okay? And maybe, provide some CCT cameras and all that. Now, what happens is that because those are just services that you are adding up to the renter, rented apartment, then it means that that property can still be classified as an investment property because the ancillary services you are providing is not so significant. But in a case where, let's take a case of a hotel where someone comes in to lodge the hotel and then moves the following day, comes in to lodge. Now, in a case of a hotel industry, it's better that they classify the hotels as owner-occupied property, plants, and equipment, rather than investment property because they, 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 they just come in and spend a few moments and go. And so the significance of the rent is not that much, unlike the case of a two-year, one-year, three-year rent. Okay, and so these are some of the things. When you are performing ancillary services, look at the significance of the service. If the services are not so significant, then you can still classify as investment property. But if the services are so significant that they depend solely on you for everything, then it is still your property that someone is occupying, and that becomes an owner-occupied property. So please let, let us take note of that as well. Because these are things that I need to draw your attention to. Because you may meet questions where they will kind of bring in these kind of tricks that is likely to confuse you. So let us be mindful of some of these things. And then also, the final thing that I also want to talk about before I go into recognition and measurement of investment property is that I want to talk about intercompany rentals. Now, so I've spoken about three things. So issues to... Take notes. I've spoken about partly owner-occupied properties and then partly rented. So, and then I've also spoken about performance of ancillary services. And then I'm also talking about intercompany rentals. Now, these intercompany rentals it's in relation to groups, okay, group of companies, where there is a parent and a subsidiary, and you realize that the parent rents out a building to a subsidiary as an investment property, or subsidiary rents out a building to parent as an investment property. Now, in such a case, it becomes an investment property in the separate financial statement. But when you are doing consolidation, we know that intra-group adjustments should be made, and therefore, this intra-group rental will not hold. You cannot call that property investment property. In a case where you are preparing 
a consolidated statement of financial position, that property will stand as an owner-occupied property because the group is seen as one single entity. But when you are preparing separate financial statements, then the company that is renting it out can call that building an investment property. And that is what we are saying. All right. Now that we have been able to understand some of these things concerning the scope, the exclusions, the examples, and then some other points to take note of, we are going to go into the recognition and measurement of investment property. And that is where we set the ball rolling with the recording of investment property. Okay. Okay, so having been able to understand all this, let us look at the recognition and measurement of investment property. So we are talking about recognition and measurement of investment property. Now, let us first talk about the recognition. Then afterwards, we'll talk about measurement. Recognition. Now, what do we mean by recognition? Recognition of investment property simply means you are incorporating the investment property onto the financial statement. So when you are recognizing it, it means you are incorporating it onto your financial statement. Then it's recognized. Now, the recognition criteria is the same as that of the owner-occupied property. That is the IES system, uh, property, plant, and equipment. So we are going to use the same criteria for investment property, and that is the recognition criteria. I'm going to explain uh, to you after I, I put it down. The first one is that before you recognize any investment property on your financial statement, all these two must hold. And the first one is that you should be sure that, so let's say it is probable. It's probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity from the use of the asset. So that's the first one. It's probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity from the property. So that is the first criteria for recognition. So be sure that this asset that you are recognizing on your financial statement as investment property is going to give some future economic benefits to the uh, company. That is the meaning of the first criteria. And the second one is that its cost can be measured reliably. So cost of the investment property can be measured reliably. So if you cannot measure the cost or you cannot estimate the cost of the investment property reliably, then there is no point recognizing it because at the end of the day, when you write investment property on your financial statement, you need to assign a value. And the value is the cost that you are going to estimate. So if you cannot do it, then what is the essence of recognizing it? Are you going to leave it blank? Okay, so these are the two criteria and you should understand them because you may be asked to talk about them when you are supposed to advise. All right, so there is no point recognizing it if you cannot measure the cost because you need to assign value on the financial statement. And that is the cost we are talking about. So having been able to understand, so if you are supposed to give an advice on this, a recognition criteria, this is what you're going to say. You say that investment property should be recognized when, one, it is probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity. Two, costs can be measured reliably. So these are the two criteria that you need for recognition. After recognition, we talk about the measurement of investment property. So measurement of investment property. Now, what is measurement? Now, you see that even in the second criteria, we spoke about measurement. We said that cost can be measured. So what is measurement? Measurement simply means you are assigning values to the asset. You assign value to the investment property then you are measuring it. So when you say this investment property's value is 10,000, that is the measurement you have done. If you say it's cost 9,000, that is the measurement. So measurement of investment property simply means you are assigning values to the investment property. Now we have two different times of measurement or instances. So let me talk about two different measurements that we do. The first one is that we have measurement at initial recognition. And then we have measurement subsequent to initial recognition. So, so, 
So initial recognition, there is measurement. So when we are doing the first recognition, the first time we are incorporating the investment property, there is a measurement. And then every year, as the company continues to operate into a foreseeable future, that is called subsequent. So subsequent years, to, we measure. And now what are the two things that we do? Now, there are two different measurement strategies that we go, or measurement approaches. We either go by the cost model or the revaluation model. So these are two models for measurement. We have the cost model, and then we have the revaluation or the fair value model. That is a revaluation model. So these are two models that we use for measurement. Either we are going by the cost model or we are going by the revaluation model. Now, measurement at initial recognition has no choice. It goes strictly by the cost model. Because at initial recognition, you may have bought the asset afresh and you cannot revalue it instantly that you, buy, you bought it. So what you need to do is that you are going to measure it at cost. So at initial recognition, it is strictly at cost. But subsequent recognitions, you have two options. You either go by the cost model or you go by the fair value model. So measurement at subsequent recognition can still go by the cost model or you can go by the fair value model, which I'm going to talk about. So what we are going to do now is that we are going to begin with the measurement at initial recognition. And we are going to, that means we are going to talk about the cost model. Measurement at initial recognition, we are going to talk about the cost model for measurement. And then we are going to take a question to solve under the cost model. And then when we are done, then we will come back to subsequent recognition and talk about the fair value model and even the cost model under the subsequent recognition. Because the cost model under the initial recognition will be slightly different from the cost model under the subsequent recognition because under subsequent recognition, we are going to talk about depreciations and impairments and other things. Okay. Now, let us take this question and then look at it together. The first question under the cost model. Illustration one. On 30th June 2010, FOG Limited acquired a site to construct a complex office building at a cost of $600,000. The complex structure is to be rented out to companies to be used as offices. Construction started on 1st September 2010 and was substantially completed on 30th June 2011 at a cost of $1 million, at which stage tenants could move in. Following misunderstanding, the first lease arrangement with tenants were signed on 1st October 2011. The building was not fully let in until July 2012. Required. Describe the recognition and measurement of this property. Now, this is the question. This is more like an advice question, okay? We are not going to make any serious calculations in this first question. What we are going to do is that we are going to tell us how they should recognize and measure this property. Now you can see that the land was acquired on 30th June. So these are the dates, 30th June, 2010. Now, from that time that the land was acquired, listen to this, because the land was acquired with the intention of developing a property to be rented out, right from that date, it should be recognized as investment property, the land itself. It should be recognized from that date as investment property at the value of the land, which is $600,000. So the land was acquired for $600,000. And that means that from that date, 2010, 30th of June, we should recognize the land as an investment property for $600,000. This is the advice that you are going to give. And then the next thing is that we are told that construction started on 1st September 2010 and was substantially completed on 30th June 2011 at a cost of $1 million. So the building was completed on 30th June 2011. That is one year after the land was acquired at a cost of $1 million. 
dollars. Okay. So at that date when it was completed, the building should also be recognized as investment property. But because the building is on the land, so the land and building becomes one as investment property. So you cannot separate the building from the land. The land's value is $600,000. The building's value is now $1 million. That is the cost incurred so far. So we are going to get a total of $1.6 million dollars as the cost of the investment property so it means that on the 30th of june or 1st july 2011 investment property should be recognized and measured at a value of 1.6 million that is the time that it was made ready for use now even though it was not occupied immediately still we recognize up to the time when it was made ready for use now any other cost incurred after this date should be treated as period costs or expenses. We should not add them to the value of the cost. We are only interested in the cost that was incurred from the date that the construction began to the date when it was completed. And that made it a qualifying asset in that period. And it means that investment property should be recognized on 30th June 2011 at 1.6 million. But on 30th June 2010, when the land was bought, we recognized the land first at six hundred thousand dollars that is what it means okay so this is what you are going to say so briefly that after the completion of the building any cost incurred you see that there was an ideal period where we were yet to rent it out and it was yet to be occupied any losses or cost incurred during that period on the building should just be treated as period expenses and should not be added to the cost of investment property so you wonder is this is that all is it that simple? Yes. This is very simple, but you need to convince the examiner. You need to say these things to let the examiner know that you understand the principles from investment property. And that is what we are going to do for that. So in the exam, if you get a question like this, you need to show these things and write English. Talk about the fact that where you are going to start the recognition, when you are going to also recognize the building and then the values at which you are going to do the recognition and you also talk about the fact that any other costs incurred after the completion of the construction should be treated as expenses for the period and that is the solution of the question it's a very simple question and then it's a very simple solution as well and this brings us to the end of the part one of our lesson on investment property in the part two of this lesson we are going to continue by looking at the measurements during the subsequent recognition, talk about the cost model, how it's going to change relation to depreciation and impairment. And then we're also going to talk about the revaluation model and then other concepts that are left to talk about in investment property. Remember to subscribe to this channel if it is your first time or you are yet to subscribe. Share this video. Let others also have a benefit. And until we meet again for the part two of this lesson, it's bye for now.